Hello and good evening. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Susanna Raminska. I'm a curator with the Free Library of Philadelphia. And we'll be getting started in just a few minutes. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks so much for joining us. My name is Susanna Raminska and I'm curator with the Free Library of Philadelphia and we'll be getting started in just a few minutes. Thank you. While we're waiting, if you'd like to drop in the chat where you're coming from and what brings you here today, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you. Thanks again for joining us. We're gonna get started in just a few minutes. And if you'd like to drop a note in the chat and let us know how you heard about tonight's event and where you're coming from, we'd love to hear from you. All right. Oh, that's great. We have some folks from Canada, California, Arizona, someone from near Philly. Wonderful. Chicago. Thank you so much for being here. We're going to just Ohio, Atlanta. Beautiful. We're just kind of letting people take the next few minutes to get situated and come on in and then we'll be getting started at around 535. If you're just joining us, my name is Susanna Raminska and I'm a curator with the Free Library of Philadelphia. And you can drop in the chat where you're coming from tonight and how you heard about tonight's event. And I see we have people from all over. I'll just share out some of the places that people are coming from Atlanta, Ohio, near Philly, Arizona, Canada, California, Chicago. All right, we're just gonna give it another minute or two. Thank you so much for coming. We're gonna get started with a really fun event tonight. We're focusing on astrolabes as part of our Medieval Life Spotlight series that's tied into the Medieval Life exhibit, which if you haven't checked it out, we'll be dropping the link in the chat shortly. And we would welcome you to visit us online. Thank you. All right, so we're going to get started. My name is Susanna. I'm a librarian by training, and I currently work at the Free Library of Philadelphia, where I work as curator of exhibitions, um, specifically focused on our special collections and all of the ma many amazing materials that we have there. So I work with our in-house curators as well as curators who we bring in for particular projects. And tonight I'm joined by Dr. Christine Larson and Dot Porter. Dot um, was actually brought in to curate our Medieval Life exhibit, which we currently have online. 
um, a preview version of it online. Um, and I'm just going to drop the link in the chat one more time. And we'd love for you to check it out. Um, due to COVID, we were not able to open the in-person exhibit, but we're just so grateful for this program series and all of our collaborators, as well as the online presence. So I'm going to hand it over to Dot and she's going to tell us a little bit more about the exhibit and then we're going to hear from um, Professor Larson about Astrolabes and do some hands-on activities. Thanks again. Thanks Susanna. I'm going to um, share my screen. I have a few slides to share with you. Um, so as Susanna said, this um, program and the other programs that we have happening in this, in this uh, group are related to my exhibition, Medieval Life, a European Manuscripts in Philadelphia Collections, which uh, was installed, but actually won't open. So the, although the exhibition is in the gallery, it won't open before it gets taken down at the end of January, which is really sad, but I have some photos to share. And of course, um, all of the information about the exhibition um, is here too. I'm actually working on some blog posts and I did a video walkthrough that I'm hoping to make available too. So you can kind of feel like you were there if you see that. The, um, the exhibition was actually um, part related to, I guess, um, a grant funded program that we did in Philadelphia um, over three years. Uh, we got a grant to digitize medieval manuscripts in Philadelphia in the Philadelphia uh, collections. And there were 15 institutions that were part of this grant. The Philadelphia Area Consortium of Special Collections Libraries were part of this. And um, there's a link to it too that I think can get dropped in the chat where you can find out more about this project. So over three years, we digitized 475 codices that is um, books, complete books and a, a much larger number of um, of pages and that is leaves and cuttings. So um, bits and pieces of manuscripts that survive. And we wanted to do an exhibition to celebrate. There are actually two exhibitions. There's the one that I curated at the Free Library and my colleague um, Nick Herman at Penn also curated an exhibition that was open for a very short time uh, in February. And so these two exhibitions are celebrating um, these collections. But what I wanted to do for medieval life was to think about how to bring medieval lived lives closer to us. I think there's a tendency for us to think about the past and think about how strange and different it was. And of course, the past was strange and different, but there are also things that we can look at and see ourselves in. And so the exhibition is divided into uh, five sections, including the natural world, which is what we're gonna be focusing on tonight. Um, and what I did um, is I looked at manuscripts that I felt spoke to the themes in ways that sort of pulled them closer to us. And I also um, looked at ways to create, um, uh, I guess, to, to bring them closer in terms of um, things that we think about today. So you'll see what I mean by that in um, when I give my um, part of the talk, I'm going to be talking about manuscripts and I'm going to be giving one of these examples um, at the end. But I don't want to talk too much actually about the exhibition. Here's how it looks. You can see it's really beautiful. The folks at the Free Library who did the design work just did an amazing, amazing job with it. Um, and I'm really sad that it's not going to be open for you. Um, but um, we could, we're going to talk more about astrolabes and then we'll talk more about some astronomical manuscripts uh, at the end. I want to go ahead and turn it over to Christine Larson. Um, thank you, Christine, for coming and being uh, part of this. I'm really thrilled to find out more about how to make my own astrolabe. Thank you very much. So I'm going to now share my screen. One of the, we're all going to be saying uh, the, the uh, buzzwords of 2020. Uh, can you hear me now? Please mm -hmm. mute yourself. I'm going to share my screen now. So I'm going to now go on to my from beginning. All right. So thank you all for coming. And hopefully you all got the a link to when you registered to the video of how to make your own astrolabe and also the PDFs of how to actually do that. So I'm going to give you a little bit of an introduction to the astrolabe, a little bit of a history lesson, a little bit of an astronomy lesson, and then show you just a handful of, this, of some sorts of computations that you might actually do with an astrolabe. 
So many of you might have seen the old fashioned planisphere that you could dial up and hold up to find out where constellations are in the sky. Or you might have one of the newer versions, an app on your cell phone where you can point your cell phone and it tells you where you are in the sky. And I always have to try to tell my students that's cheating because I want to teach you how to find the constellations. But that's sort of what the astrolabe did was those things. And many of you have a calculator, either you have the calculator function on your phone or you might have a calculator from a class that you took. And before that we had slide rules and Astrolabes did that too. So Astrolabes did many of the things that some of our modern technology actually still does today. So what is an astrolabe? Well, the name dates to probably the mid 14th century from an old French word astrolabe from the medieval Latin, which comes from Greek, which means star taker or star thief, which is kind of interesting. And I love this quote from Petra Schmidl from the University of Frankfurt that it describes an astrolabe as a multifunctional and multi-purpose astronomical device that can be used for observation, calibration, and teaching for amusement, decoration, and representation. And since I have one, it can also be used for muscle building because this sucker's pretty heavy. Um, to put it short, an astrolabe is a two-dimensional model of a three-dimensional world that you can hold in your hand or put in your pocket if you have a really big pocket because a workable astrolabe would have been about this big. Something that was smaller, like my smaller model I have here, would have really just been used for teaching. It would not have had the precision to actually do calculations because astrolabe, a good quality astrolabe made from a master craftsman could actually measure time to within five minutes of precision. So it was actually quite good. Now, there are many sort of uh, things that people use to actually observe the sky. They had sundials to tell the time during the day. They had nocturnals, which would tell the time by the stars. So you could call them day clocks and night clocks. And we also had other things that represented the night sky. Uh, if you were a Game of Thrones fans, like me, I have my Game of Thrones cup here. Uh, if you were a Game of Thrones fan in the opening credits, you might have seen this whirling dervish thing during the credits, which sort of was supposed to look medieval to you. It was sort of an invention of the minds behind the show, sort of based on something that we would call an armillary sphere. An armillary sphere was sort of a representation of the universe with the earth at the center and the heavens around it. And by twisting it around, it allowed you again to make sort of calculations of where objects were in the sky at different times. And astrolabes and armillary spheres Whenever you want something to look medieval in a movie, if you throw in an astrolabe or an armillary sphere in the background, it's like, ooh, it must be medieval. So creators of Harry Potter, you go into Dumbledore's office and you know that it's medieval because you've got the astrolabes and the armillary spheres. A lot of times what you will see is something that looks like this. And this is sometimes called a mariner's astrolabe. And a mariner's astrolabe is, only has really one job, and that job is to find the altitude or height above the horizon of a star. So what you would do, as seen in this picture, is you would hold it up and you would look at a star in the sky and you would sight through this line through two pinholes, how high something was in the sky, and it had a protractor built into the back, and you could measure that angle. An astrolabe will do that, but it does so much more. And so the sort of ultimate astrolabe does all these sorts of calculations and computations and measurements. And that's what we call a planispheric astrolabe. So this is sort of the, the ultimate Cadillac version of an astrolabe, and that's what we normally think of when we think of an astrolabe. So who, what, where, when, 
Who would have had an astrolabe? Well, they would have been used by astrologers casting horoscopes. They would have been used by astronomers making measurements of the heavens, educated individuals and religious persons who needed to measure time for ceremonies would have used these. They were usually made out of high precision metal, usually brass. Those would have been expensive and out of reach of most individuals. People who had them would have passed them down as family heirlooms. Now, there were cheaper versions made out of paper and wood. They were not as accurate as my cardboard astrolabe is not nearly as accurate, and I am certainly not a master craftsman. Um, the thing is, these would not have survived to today as well as the metal ones. So you tend to see the metal ones in the museums. And particularly because the, and this is a, this is not a real medieval astrolabe, this is a, a reproduction, but real medieval astrolabes are beautiful works of art, as you will see. And again, the small ones, the ones less than six inches in diameter were not very accurate, probably only used for teaching. Now, what's the beginning of the astrolabe? That's a little murky. It seems as though they were used from about the 6th century to about the 19th century. The widespread use started earlier in the Muslim Middle East and then migrated into Europe. And then they ended in the opposite. They sort of died out in uh, Europe and then were still used in the Muslim Middle East later on. But they were also used in the Indian subcontinent and China and Northern Africa. So they really had a wide geographic distribution. And the main idea here is you're taking the heavens, which are three-dimensional, and you're trying to make them flat. You're trying to take something three-dimensional and make it two-dimensional. And that's not a trivial thing. And I give you as, as an example, think about a globe of the earth, right? A globe of the earth is a three-dimensional round thing. You have to now take that and make a flat map. And hopefully you all know that Greenland really isn't as large as it looks in the Mercator projection, because that's just the way that one way that you can take a three dimensional Earth and squash it flat is to realize that you're going to have distortion at the top and bottom of the map. One of the important stepping stones along the way to making an astrolabe was the work of this guy, Claudius Ptolemy. Ptolemy thrived uh, between about 900 to 168 CE. And he was one of the people who cataloged stars in the sky with the unaided eye. Of course, telescope doesn't come in until the 1600s. And there's an apocryphal story, which means that it's not true, but it sounds really good, that the astrolabe was invented when Ptolemy was carrying his armillary sphere while he was riding his camel, and he dropped it, and the camel stepped on the armillary sphere and flattened it out, and that's how the astrolabe was born. We're pretty sure that's not how it happened, but it's a pretty good story. So we don't really know who built the first astrolabe. The earliest surviving descriptions come from about 530 CE. They come from uh, a pamphlet, the treatise concerning the using and arrangement of the astrolabe and the things engraved upon it. That is to say what each signifies. I'm so glad books don't have such long titles anymore. But the oldest known dated astrolabe that actually has like a date on it, or we could actually figure out when it was made, is really only about a thousand years old. And we have one here that was um, that was is owned by the University of London. There was one that was at least 200, maybe 150, 200 years older. And we don't know where it is. It's probably in someone's private collection now, unfortunately. We think that there are about a dozen that we have that are about a thousand years old, but only three of them have dates on them. And it turns out you can actually figure out roughly how old an astrolabe is. More on that later. So I'm going to get really nerdy on you for two slides. So if your eyes glaze over, it'll just be for two slides, I promise. But I would be remiss if I didn't go full geek for those in the audience who are of that persuasion. So remember I said that we're taking this three-dimensional version of the heavens and trying to make it flat. 
Now there's two ways that you can sort of picture the three-dimensional heavens. One is that armillary sphere. You can imagine the earth being at the center of the universe and everything around the earth. And if you do that, you can imagine the earth being stationary and the heavens rising and setting above, you know, orbiting around the earth. And so if you do that, you make something called a celestial sphere. You take essentially all of those cardinal points that you learn in, in a geography class, the North Pole, the South Pole, the equator, lines of latitude, lines of longitude, and you just project them into space and make a grid on the sky. So that's one way of sort of dividing up how the sky looks. Another way of dividing up the sky looks is to just go out your front door and look up and go, okay, as seen from New Britain, Connecticut, the sky looks like this. The North Star is over there, East is over here, West is over here. So there's two different frames of reference. There's a local frame of reference, and then there's sort of a more universal frame of reference. And what the astrolabe does is it takes both of those frames of reference and puts them flat simultaneously on top of each other. And that's why it can do all of those really cool calculations. And the ancient Greeks sort of started us on this idea because, you know, the ancient Greeks really love geometry. Nothing personal, but that wouldn't have been my first love. But they started really thinking about this 2,500 years ago. And so it's sort of been a step-by-step -step process of how do we take these versions of the night sky and flatten them and put them together. And one term that was used by the ancient Greeks that I think is really cool is unfolding the sphere, which is kind of sounds better than flattening it. All right, so out of the geekiness, those two different ways of looking at the night sky represent the two main pieces of the astrolabe. You have something that looks like a piece of weird graph paper. That is the projection of your local sky, going out your front door, looking up, how does it look to you? And then you have this other piece, which is really where the artistry comes in, which, which represents that universal sort of armillary sphere. And so you put them on top of each other and you overlay them and it's like a Reese's peanut butter cup, two great tastes that are even better together, right? The chocolate and the peanut butter. So the major components of an astrolabe are as follows. And so if you, uh, if you looked at the video, if you look at the video that was sent out, uh, it has the different pieces. So here we have, here's our, here's our graph paper. So that graph paper is the front of the astrolabe. And this graph paper depends on what latitude you're at. So the spacing of the lines on that graph paper depends upon what latitude you're at, where you are on the earth. And so we call that the plate because they didn't have graph paper back then, so they wouldn't call it the graph paper, but that's essentially what it is. And then on top of it, you again have this other piece that represents that armillary sphere, that sort of universal heavens pretending that they orbit the earth. And that's called the reet or reedy. And then you have to line things up. So you have to have something that you can use as a pointer. And so this pointer thing we call the rule. And so those are the things on, on the major working pieces on the front of the astrolabe. And then that piece on the back that I showed you where you would line up and sight a star, you can see that poking out the back here. That's something called an alidade. So here is a close-up of the front of the astrolabe, and you can see that it has north, south, east, and west. You can see that it has times written around the edges. You can again see that graph paper that represents where things are in the sky. And the edge of the graph paper, where there's no more graph coming off of it, that represents your horizon, how far you can see in any direction in the sky. Now this dotted line down here is, is kind of cool. 
that represents when the sun is below the horizon, because again, here's the horizon. So when the sun is below the horizon, but it's not quite perfectly dark yet, twilight, evening twilight and morning twilight, that's what that dotted line represents. And these different points on, on the, the front of the astrolabe represent different parts of the night sky. For example, the zenith, the point directly overhead. And the, the points that you might have heard of that, that uh, give you the seasons, right? The Tropic of Cancer, the Tropic of Capricorn. So all of these lines are represented on the front of the astrolabe. And depending on what you were calculating, you might use one or more of those lines. So here's a close up and you can see the graph paper. The graph paper has two different kinds of lines, sort of you could think of it like going horizontally and vertically. The azimuth lines are your direction think compass point. I'm looking in the northeast, I'm looking in the west, I'm looking in the southwest. So that's what these lines are that wrap around. Then you have the lines that say, how high up in the sky does something look to me? And that's what we, those are the almucanters. And these are different numbers of degrees. So the horizon would be zero, because you're zero degrees above the horizon. The zenith would be 90 degrees above the horizon. And then each of these lines moving up from zero to 90, you can see here, zero, 20, 40, 60, 80, 90. Right? So that's what that graph paper is there for. And remember I said that this graph paper looks different for different places on earth, for different latitudes. So here I'm showing you what that graph paper, the plate would look like if you were at a latitude of 25 degrees where it's much warmer and at 60 degrees where it's much colder, much further north. And you can see that the graph paper, the projection looks different because the sky looks different from different places on the earth. And despite what you might have heard, medieval people, you know, they did think the earth was flat. They traveled, they went north and south. They knew that the sky changed as you went north and south. And the only way that could be true is if the earth was round, if the earth was a globe. So if you were a homebody and didn't move around very much, having an astrolabe with one graph paper would suit you just fine. But what if you were a merchant and you traveled around and you used your astrolabe for navigation? Well, as you moved hundreds of miles north and south, the sky would change. And so it would be too expensive to buy multiple astrolabes. So what you would do is essentially you would buy multiple graph papers and you would take off the screw and pop on the, the plate, the graph paper for wherever you were going. And there was actually a standard set of graph papers, a standard set of plates for different latitudes of places that were very important. So these were defined by Ptolemy as the standard climates. And this is a beautiful reproduction set cr uh, crafted by Norman Green, which has an astrolabe with a set of the seven plates. And so that movable part, the reedy that I was talking to you about, that was the part that was sort of mimicking the armillary sphere. Again, thinking of the earth being at the center and the heavens moving around the earth. And again, we know that really it's the earth going around the sun. But as we orbit around the sun, our perspective changes. And that's why we can sort of mimic it by thinking about the earth being stationary and the sun appearing to move around us. And so if, if, we would, if we can imagine that the sun was a light bulb and had a pull chain on it, if we turned off the sun and looked in the direction of the sun, depending upon what the day of the year is, we would see a different constellation behind the sun. And so if we did that over the course of the year, every day, we would turn off the sun for a minute and we would see what constellation is behind the sun. 
over the course of the year, you would trace out a band of constellations. That band of constellations is what most people know of as the zodiac. The technical astronomical term is the ecliptic. Okay? And so you can talk about the year, not by March, April, May, June, July, August, whatever. You could define the year by Cancer, Leo, Virgo, Libra, Scorpius, Sagittarius. And if you look on the Reedy here, what do you have here? This is the year, but it's not the year written out by date. It's the astrological year written out by the position of the sun relative to the background constellations. And so it's another way of telling time throughout the year by using the fact that if we imagine the earth is staying stationary, it looks like the sun moves from one constellation to another. Now the backs of an astrolabe will vary depending upon what culture made that astrolabe because the back of the astrolabe is really the calculator part, the computer part. And you want to calculate certain things depending upon what's valuable to you, right? You're going to buy your calculator based on whatever func functionality you want. So this is what the typical back of what we, what we might refer to as a Western or European or Christian astrolabe might be. These things up here are called the unequal hour scale. Uh, the monks in the monasteries would sometimes use what we called unequal hours. They would break the day into 12 pieces and the night into 12 pieces. But during the summer, there's more daylight. So during the summer, a day hour would be very long and a night hour would be very short. And those are what we call unequal hours. And to calculate the prayer times in the monastery, they might use that sort of astrolabe. But if you were in the Muslim world, you would want to calculate, for example, the times of prayer. You would want to calculate the direction to Mecca. And so you would have different things on the back of your astrolabe that would allow you to make those types of calculations. And so one of the things that I've, I've taught some of my students is how to do Islamic prayer times by using astronomy. So the different Islamic prayer times, you have morning astronomical twilight, you have local noon when the sun is highest in the sky, you have afternoon prayers, which are based on the length of, the sh of a shadow, you have sunset prayers, and you have prayers at the end of evening twilight. So these are all defined astronomically by the position of the sun in the sky, which means that you can calculate all of them using an astrolabe. And so <clears throat> briefly, here is a, a mock-up of the back of an Islamic astrolabe. And I've shown you the various things that you can do. So the purple arrow points to little cheat lines that are shortcuts for finding how high the sun would be at local noon on any day of the year, depending upon your latitude. So you, you would know exactly when to do your noontime prayers by measuring when the sun hit that particular height in the sky, that's local noon, it's time for noontime prayers. The green arrow points to sort of cheater lines that show you from different cities, for example, Baghdad, Cairo, Constantinople, and Ishfa. If the sun is at, when the sun is at a certain angle in the sky on a certain time on a certain day, that's the direction of Mecca from that city. And the blue arrow, remember uh, in the previous slide, I said that the afternoon prayers has to do with the length of a shadow. And you can calculate what time that shadow is the right length by using the part of the astrolabe that I've marked with the blue arrow. So there are lots of amazing calculations that you could do with just that one tool. So here are some beautiful pictures of astrolabes. Here's the backs of two actual astrolabes to show you the things that I've just been talking about. And again, these are beautiful, beautiful works of art. Practical uses of an astrolabe, you've always heard, you know, Billy, but wait, there's more, there's more uses. 
there is a treatise that was produced about a thousand years ago that had 386 chapters with a thousand different uses for an astrolabe. I think he might have double counted a few. But the main uses were measuring time for religion, for again, the prayer times and the directions, for casting horoscopes and doing astrology. And you can also use an astrolabe for surveying and navigation to find the heights of mountains, to find the heights of buildings, to find distances, and to figure out where you were in the world if you were sailing. So for example, this diagram shows you how you might actually use an astrolabe to figure out the height of a tree or the height of a building. You use that square on the back of the astrolabe that I showed you in the last one of the last slides, and you would actually cite the top of the building or the, the top of the tree. And then you would use the scales down here and a little geometry. And you could actually figure out how tall the building is. So some very famous treatises have been written about astrolabes. Uh, here's one, the book on the construction of the astrolabe from 856, on the use of the astrolabe in 1147 by Adelard of Bath, which was dedicated to the young Henry II. Probably one of the most famous treatises is that by Geoffrey Chaucer. And also what's interesting about Geoffrey Chaucer is that not only did he know a lot of astronomy, but he knew that his audience, his well-read audience would have known a lot of astronomy as well. And there are many, many astronomical references sort of as in-jokes in the Canterbury Tales. And his treatise on the astrolabe dated to about 1391 is sort of the first main English non-Latin uh, uh, non-Arabic, but English language treatises on the astrolabe. And it was written to his son. There's still some debate as whether it was actually to his son. But in the dedication, he talks about little Lewis, my son, you're a smart little kid. You're interested in science and math. But you know what? There really aren't any good books on astrolabes written for little kids who are smart but don't know Latin. So I'm going to write that book for you. And it's going to have five parts. Well, he actually only wrote two of them, but there you go. And this is the so-called Chaucer astrolabe dated to 1326. It's similar to the one that, that Chaucer actually describes, and this is in the British Museum. Now, over the course of the centuries, and again, these things are big and bulky if you want a very precise one, they figured out that you could cut corners. Literally, you could literally cut an astrolabe into quarters and have a quadrant and be able to do most of the calculations. And remember that the sky would look different from different parts of the earth. And so you would have to have different graph papers. You'd have to have different plates, which means you'd have to carry more stuff with you. So, so they came up with a universal astrolabe that you could use from any latitude. But by the 17th century in Europe, the astrolabe goes the way of the dodo. We have mechanical clocks, we have telescopes, we have surveying instruments. Astrolabes were still used for religious calculations in the Muslim world until probably the early 19th century. But modern interest in astrolabe has really, uh, I, like I just got an email if you excuse me, a few months ago from a museum in Germany where they wanted my opinion on what the, someone was claiming that had brought to them and claimed was a, a medieval astrolabe. And from their, their description, I'm like, that would not have been precise enough to actually do calculations. It's what we call a pseudo astrolabe. So looking at astrolabes, we can reconstruct the astronomical and technological knowledge of past cultures. And again, Chaucer had a lot of astronomical in-jokes in his literature. So people who teach medieval literature and medieval culture and medieval history should probably know something about astrolabes, know, have to know a little science. And there are two really big museum collections that I can recommend. I've seen both of them. They're absolutely amazing uh, of astrolabes. One is in the Museum of the History of Science in Oxford, England. 
and again, beautiful, beautiful work of art. Uh, here is one of their prized possessions. It's a Queen Elizabeth I personal astrolabe. She supposedly had several of them. Uh, this may have been a gift from her favorite courtier. It's now again owned by the Science Museum in Oxford. They actually have an online catalog of 150 instruments. So if you ever get bored and want to look at pictures of these things, absolutely beautiful. The Adler Planetarium in Chicago also has a beautiful collection and they have two beautiful books of pictures of their astrolabes. And again, you can get reproductions and you can collect these things. This one here is eight inches and it's, again, I could use it like for bicep curls. It's more than six pounds. Now I mentioned that we could actually figure out the age of an astrolabe, even if it's not stamped directly on it. Now, if it's stamped directly on it, that would, that would, be, that would be awesome. But remember I said that we can tell about where the astrolabe was ma made to work from by the graph paper, by the plate, okay? We can also, if we know if the craftsmanship is a certain way, we know that certain master craftsmen always tended to work with certain metals. They tended to work with a certain way. And so by looking at the craftsmanship, by looking at the language, by looking at the writing, by looking at the chemistry of the metal, we can tell you something about roughly when and where it was actually made. But we can actually date within about 70 years by looking at what uh, the reedy. Again, this movable part here, remember that had the zodiac on it? Remember I said that we could describe the year, not just by May, June, July, August, September, but by, you know, Scorpius, Sagittarius, Capricornus? The earth wobbles. The earth is not only a spinning top, but it's a wobbling spinning top. And the Earth's axis, the North Pole, wobbles in space about once every 26,000 years. What that means is that the North Pole, the North Star today, the star that the North Pole points towards, which you might heard Polaris, the North Star. Polaris has not always been the North Star, nor will it always be the North Star. This is something that was actually known to the ancient Greeks. They compared their star maps to even older ancient Egyptian star maps and the stars had shifted. And so they, they knew that the ancient Egyptians were great astronomers, so they didn't mess up. The sky had actually shifted. And the amount by, you know, I'd say, oh my God, 26,000 years, that's a huge cycle. Yes, but remember the precision to which these things were made by looking at the orientation of the ecliptic of the zodiac on the reedy of the astrolabe, we can actually date an astrolabe to within about 70 to 75 years, which is pretty darn amazing. That's one way that astronomy is actually useful to people in the arts. We can help you guys to date astrolabes. To give you a really extreme example, we did not have astrolabes back in 2800 BCE. But if we did, I want you to compare the difference. See how the constellations have shifted very dramatically from one to the other? And so this gives you an idea. Again, we're looking for little tiny changes, but we can see those little tiny changes over as little as about 70 years. So here's some more pictures from the Oxford collection. You can see how beautiful they are. And again, they've taken them apart so you can actually see the front, the back, and especially the reedy. I love the reedies. These little pointers all point to bright stars. And you can make your pointers as ornate as you want. Some of them are flames, some of them are swords, some of them are leaves or flowers. And you can see the beautiful, beautiful filigree work on these things. They are just so absolutely gorgeous. And again, these could tell time to within about five minutes. Absolutely beautiful works of art.
Again, you can see why they were valued and passed down as family heirlooms. Absolutely, I mean, look, look at the, the detail. I mean, this is absolutely, absolutely breathtakingly gorgeous craftsmanship. And this is a calculator. Now, a special note, I keep talk, harping on the telling time part. An astrolabe tells you the local time, how the sky looks from your location. It does not take into account daylight savings time, just because that didn't exist. Does not take into account time zones, because time zones didn't exist. And if you just read off the time on an astrolabe, it does not take into account the fact that there's a correction factor of a few minutes due to the fact that the Earth's orbit around the sun is not perfectly round. Now, this correction factor was known to makers of astrolabes, and you could put that correction factor in. But if you just read the time off of an astrolabe and go jump on the computer and read it, you're going to be like, ah, the time's wrong. This is a piece of junk. Hmm. No, you have to put in the correction factors. And once you do that, you get the right answer. So I just wanted to throw that in. So I'm going to walk you just through just a couple of really basic sort of computations. Two things. When you're talking about an astrolabe, remember I talked about the zodiac, right? That was based on the position of the sun relative to the background stars. So when you do most calculations in an astrolabe, the very first thing you need to do is figure out where the sun is relative to the stars. And you need to convert your date, March, April, May, June, July, to what we call the astrological date, to where along the zodiac the sun would be. So for example, if I was doing this on March 21st and I flipped over to the back of my astrolabe and I found where March 21st is, March 21st is over, over here, I would line this up and I would figure out where in the zodiac the sun would be. And so on March 21st, the sun is in the constellation of Aries at the very beginning at what we call the first point of Aries. So the, the vernal equinox, the spring equinox is defined as the beginning of Aries, the first point of Aries. So that, that would, the astrological date would be Aries 1. So March 21st equals Aries 1, okay? In many of the calculations, you need to find the height of the sun in the sky to figure out what time it is. Now, remember that I mentioned that you might want to line this up and figure out where a star is in the sky. Uh, hopefully, you guys know you don't do that with the sun. You don't look at the sun. So don't be like this guy here looking at the sun because that's just bad. What you would actually do is you would hold your astrolabe down here and you would let it cast a shadow on the ground. And by looking at the shadow, by looking at the sun passing through the two dots on the alidate on the back, then you could safely figure out the angle, the height of the sun in the sky. So don't be like this guy. He won't be doing astrolabes for very long. Don't be like the no guy, be like the yes guy. So once we know the astrological date and once we know the angle of the sun in the sky, then I can figure out what time it is. So let me run you through a quick example. Let's say that it was March 17th. Okay, I don't know why I like March 17th, but March 17th. Again, flipping to the back of the astrolabe, I figure out that the astrological date was the 27th day of Pisces or Pisces 27. So now I go to the front of the astrolabe, go to the Reedy, which has the ecliptic or the zodiac on it. And I find, I find my Pisces 27. See how I've circled Pisces, tw Pisces 27 in here. And let's say that I went out and I safely, safely used the shadow 
and I found that the sun was 20 degrees above the horizon in the eastern part of the sky, that it was morning. Sorry, I'm getting twisted on my little cord here. So let's imagine that I found the sun 20 degrees above the horizon in the east. So I know it's sometime in the morning. All I have to do is take my astrolabe and move it such that the position of the sun, the position of the sun I said is defined by Pisces 27, and I have to place it 20 degrees above the horizon. So I take my graph paper, I find where the 20 degree line is, and I rotate the zodiac so that Pisces 27 lies on this 20 degree line. And then I line up my little ruler and I can read off exactly what time it is. And it turns out to be at this point, 7.55 AM, local time, not taking into account daylight savings time or time zones, got it? So that's how you could actually do that. And it actually takes a lot less time to do it than it took me to explain it. I could actually whip that calculation out in like two minutes, literally, if you knew what you were doing. It was, it's actually a very, very simple thing to do. You could also tell time by the stars doing the same thing. So what you would do is you, and you would have to know some stars. You'd have to know some bright stars. So I could go out and I could find the height in the sky of two bright stars that I happen to know. And then if I find those two bright stars, remember in all those beautiful, all in all the reedies, all the little flames and the leaves and the pointers, and I said each pointer was a bright star. Let's say that I found these two bright stars, Procyon and Rigel. And let's say that I went out and I measured Rigel to be 35 degrees above the horizon and Procyon to be 50 degrees above the horizon. Then I would just mimic that on the graph paper on my astrolabe. And once I set up my astrolabe such that Procyon was at the right height and Rigel was at the right height, then all I needed to do is figure out where the sun is. And you're like, wait a minute, the sun's not out when the stars are out. Yes, I know. But what are we always telling time in relation to on the afterlife? The position of the sun. So even though the sun is down here below the horizon, I still see where it is on my afterlife. So I just line up my rule to the position of the sun, which we said was Pisces 27. And it tells me what time it is at night. And it turns out to be 714 PM. Kind of cool that you can actually use the sun even when you can't see the sun, because you know where it would be in the zodiac on that particular day. What time is sunset on that day? Well, I know that the sun is going to set when it's on the horizon in the west, right? So all I have to do is twist my astrolabe and take my Pisces 27 and move it down here to the western horizon where it would be setting, line up the little ruler, and it tells me that sunset should be about 5.42 p.m. that day. So these are the sorts of calculations that you could easily do with an astrolabe. And I could do morning twilight. Morning twilight is actually defined as to when the sun, sun is 18 degrees below the horizon. And again, remember I said that was that dotted line that was below the horizon. So I could do the same thing. I could take the position of the sun on that day in the zodiac, which I said was Pisces 27. I could rotate it onto this dashed line, line up with my little ruler, and it turns out that the time of morning twilight on March 17th is 4.31 a.m. Again, local time. And the astrolabe, I, I'm sorry for those of you that are not in Philadelphia because the astrolabe template that I sent out was for Philadelphia, but you can actually go and um, you can go online and you can download and you can get your uh, the astrolabe pro astrolabe project.com i think it is and you can get your make your own template for whatever latitude you like so a couple of different um different uh 
resources, astrolabeproject.com. There's this great book uh, by James Morrison, everything you ever wanted to know about the astrolabe, but were afraid to ask. Um, I have our Facebook page here for our planetarium and observatory and our Twitter handle. And so hopefully I've piqued your interest a little bit about medieval history and medieval astronomy and about how science and art work together to actually make beautiful art out of the heavens and make the heavens into some beautiful art. So thank you very much for your attention. And thank you so much. This was an amazing presentation. We learned so much. And I just wanted to make sure before turning to Dot, if we have a chance just to answer some of the questions, we got all kinds of wonderful comments, um, but a couple of questions I wanted to share. One is how did knowledge of how to construct and use the technology pass through different cultures or pass between different cultures? This would have, again, the, the people, this was not something that was sort of owned by a particular culture. I mean, the ancient Greeks started a lot of it and it moved from, as best we can tell, sort of ancient Greeks got it started, went into the medieval, uh, into the um, Islamic world in the Middle East, then sort of drifted out from there in various places and different cultures sort of put their own slant on it. Because this was master craftsmanship, a lot of it would have been, you know, passing it on to your apprentice. But there were these treatises that were written. And these treatises were copied by learned people and translated from one language to another. And so that's one way that the, so there's sort of two threads here. There's the actual craftsmanship, which probably would have been, you know, I'm going to show you how to make this and, you know, show this person and show this person. And then there were the treatises that were passed along and copied and translated and augmented and added to and annotated. And I found a better way to do that. And I'm going to write it in the column here. And in the next edition, hopefully somebody will put that in. So the, the information really just sort of flowed east, west, west, east, north, south, all over the place. Amazing. And it really speaks to the global history that we can learn from during this time period. That's amazing. Um, we had another question regarding some of the um, segments or you know, the, the different uh, sort of graph paper segments, I guess, that you were talking about. Mm -hmm. um, would there be a way to repair or improvise those if you dropped some or all of it at sea or broke it? Oh boy, well, depending on how handy you were. I would have to say, I would basically just cry personally because I'm not handy at all. But, you know, um, maybe there would, you'd have a backup somewhere or, you know, it, it depended on how precise you needed your calculations to be. And so, like I said, they did make some out of paper and wood. So maybe there were some backups, uh, but you would have treated these like that heirloom wonderful, very carefully because, you know, work of art expensive you know only certain master craftsmen so i i yeah you wouldn't have held it over the side of the ship to do your to do your observation for sure absolutely just a few more questions um do regular astrolabes find the altitude of stars as well that is one of the most common usages so i would say that I have yet to see an astrolabe that could not be used for that purpose. I'm not saying that somebody could have made one, but you know, as long as it has, as long as it has the alidade that you can sight on, then it's going to be able to find the altitude of stars and the sun. Perfect. Um, and if we didn't get to your question, I I'm going into the Q and A now. Um, then please feel free to share it. I'm just gonna share three more questions. Um, Brian wants to know, can we find astrolabes calibrated for Oakland, California or any other latitude or longitude? That's a great question because we have a international audience with us tonight. Yes, definitely. Um, I am just, if you go to that link, the um, astrolabeproject.com, and I will put the link into the chat, 
you can put in, you, they have what's called an astrolabe generator. And you can put in whatever city you want. They, you can either, you know, you can get the exact latitude for your backyard and it will generate it out exactly how you want it. It'll make it round. It'll make it um, the stop sign excuse me, shape that I have. You can have it with different simple backs or complicated backs and, and yeah. So you can, and, and essentially once you print out the template, you can follow the directions that are in the video link that you, that I gave you that you can still use. But if you want to make the actual graph paper, make it for your location, that's where I always get mine is I go to the astrolabeproject.com and use their astrolabe generator. Perfect. Thank you. Um, here's a question. And if I'm not understanding it correctly, maybe um, we can have the person kind of expound, but um, they write, I would think that some of the aspects would be classified military technology. Did military secrets slow the spread of the tech? So were there military uses of this tool that you know of? Uh, you could certainly, I mean, obviously it would, it could be used for surveying and if it can be used for surveying, you can figure out how far away the enemy is. So, but, but this was all basic math. There's no way you could hide it. It was anyone who wanted to, this, this was open to anyone who wanted to learn it. That was, but yes, there would have been, there will have been military applications in terms of the surveying and finding distances and finding time, but there's no way you could classify that information. Great, thank you. And then um, I'm just gonna sort of maybe give a brief answer to this question and we can dive more into it after Dot gives her piece, but um, were there alternatives to this for those who couldn't afford them? And I think for, for now, maybe we can kind of think about the paper and wood versions um, that Dr. Larson shared. And then the last question, Dr. Larson, before we turn it over to Dot, are there other su surprising calculations possible with an astrolabe? Oh, there are all sorts of things. You can actually do trigonometry on the back of them. You can do all sorts of calculations. It's, it's amazing. Like I said, that one treatise claimed there were a thousand different uses. I don't know. I think he exaggerated a little bit, but you can do many, many different calculations of where you are, when you are, what the sky will look like at any given time from any given location on the earth. Thank you so much. And I, I'm not sharing out loud, but there's so many comments in the chat that are going directly to the panelists right now about how engaging your talk was. So thank you again. Dot, I wanna turn it over to you and I'll be dropping links in the chat while you present. So take it away whenever you're ready. Okay, I am sharing my screen. Now, so here we are back. So uh, thank you so much, Dr. Larson. That was really uh, great. And also great because um, a lot of what I'm gonna be talking about sort of reflects what you were talking about, which is good. It means that I picked pick good manuscripts uh, for this part. So um, as I said, when I was um, introducing the talk, um, one of the sections of this exhibition is about the natural world and um, it, it even starts out there saying the night sky was very important to philosoph medieval philosophers and, and scientists. And so um, some of the, uh, there we go. Um, so these are a few of the manuscripts um, that were included. Some of them are, are in the exhibition itself. Um, a lot of them aren't because there were only a couple that were included in the exhibition. So one of the nice things about this is that I can show you some other ones as well. Um, so this is actually um, from a 15th century English um, manuscript, um, which is uh, the, the manuscript itself contains a series of astronomical tables um, and a uh, secondary text concerning astrology and planetary movements. And so this is something as from uh, Professor Larson's talk, and, and you'll also see it here, the line between astronomy and astrology, it just in terms of the, um, the use of the signs of the zodiac were, were much closer, I think, than when we think about like modern astronomy, you don't really, you don't really talk so much about, about the zodiac, but, but for them, it was, it was very closely combined and also in medicine. And so some of what we'll be looking at is medicine. Um, but this uh, here is, um, and, and 
illustration of an astrolabe, obviously like part of an astrolabe um, in this manuscript. So in addition to um, having, having the physical objects, there are also a lot of diagrams that you see in astronomical um, manuscripts containing astronomical texts that are very similar to astrolabes. And we'll, I'll show you uh, many of these. So this is a 15th century one from England, um, and they're also all over um, Europe as well. And, and this is just a shot of the book as it looks in the exhibition. So this is the, the image that we took as part of the Bibliophily project. Um, and then this is the book sitting in the, um, in the in the gallery and here is a um replica astrolabe so the free library doesn't own one and i don't think we were able we weren't able to find one in um in philadelphia so uh we purchased one uh for the purpose of putting it in the exhibition and you can see down in the left hand corner um the plate so it actually came with several plates and this is probably this is fairly small, I think. Um, so I'm pulling my hands up like this. It's not, it's not a really large one, um, but it's, it's interesting to look at in, a, um, in, a, in the case. And I, and I expect you could probably take it out and, and use it, but it's mostly for, uh, for looks, but it was nice to have it in the, in the exhibition. Um, so this is a University of Pennsylvania manuscript. And this is the quadrant um, that Dr. Larson was talking about where you could take, um, you know, take the astrolabe and divide it into quarters. So this is an, an illustration of a quadrant um, from a treatise on the use of the astrolabe quadrant. So the whole the whole text is about how you actually use this, um, including things such as locating and predicting the position of stars, computing the 12 houses of the horoscope, so computing the, the zodiac, and measuring altitude, latitude, and time. So all these things that we've been talking about um, are described here. Uh, and the manuscript itself, this is from Italy from the early 16th century. So a little bit later um, than the one that we looked at just before uh, and from Italy instead of from England. This is fun. So this is um, an illustration from a German mid 15th century medical and astrological miscellany. Um, and this is, this is one of the texts I was talking about where you really see how these, um, how the study of the stars sort of mixes in with everything else. So this is a manuscript I like very much. In addition to um, looking to this particular illustration where you can see he's got a quadrant and he's looking at the stars and his friend is taking notes, I suppose, on what he's what he's finding. Um, there is a lot about the, the zodiac. Um, there are um, there are um, descriptions of, of bloodletting and diagrams on like where you draw blood depending on what you learn from the horoscope. So these things for sort of practical purposes were, um, were very closely, uh, closely aligned. Um, and this is another uh, German mid 15th century medical and astro astronomical miscellany. And you can see here that these charts have to do with the um, with the the moon. Do I have this right? Um, these are Latin and German texts concerning astronomy, astrology, um, including, as I said, figuring out when the best times and places are for taking blood, um, and also medicine. And so here we have um, the. Um, Eclipse, you know, the, the, the moon, the eclipses, the, the times of the moon. Sorry, not thinking. Um, let's see. So they were actually looking, they're paying attention to a lot of different aspects of, of the sky. So this should look familiar because we looked at something similar to this in um, Dr. Larson's talk. This is from a a, a manuscript written in Hebrew um, in Catalonia in circa 1361. And it is from a translation of Ptolemy's Al um, Almagest, which we also heard about. So this is where Ptolemy um, outlines the geocentric model of the, of the universe. That is this idea that the earth is the center and the um, the universe, you know, the, the sun goes around the earth and thus the planets also 
go around the earth in sort of interesting uh, ways, which we'll look at in just a, a moment. So this um, is, a, is sort of an image of that. And then I have um, another one. So Ptolemy's um, Almagest was incredibly influential. So he wrote it in um, the second century um, and it was sort of for 1200 years, it was the way that people thought the universe worked. And so this is a, um, from Italy from the late 15th century, another um, illustration of how um, this concept sort of worked. Um, and, and you see these a lot. So in, in astronomical manuscripts and in um, all kinds of manuscripts, anywhere where you're talking about the cosmology of the universe, you're going to see this where the earth is in the center and then um, the sun and the planets uh, come out and then you can see there's God uh, up at the top here. Um, so this is, a, this is sort of interesting. This is um, an Arabic text that was copied in Spain in um, the 14th century. And it is an uh, extensive treatise on Aristotelian astronomy, which is what Ptolemy based his, his uh, concepts on, considering the motions of the stars and the planets in a spherical geocentric universe. And um, one of the things that, that um, medieval astronomers had to deal with was that the planets moved strangely in the sky. Um, they, we know that you know they, they move like this because we're all going around the sun. So if you think, well, we're all going around the sun, of course the planets are going to do strange things in the sky. Um, but if, if the planets are actually moving around the earth, um, they're doing very strange things. And so they, this is a manuscript that talks a lot about that. And that's what these, um, these diagrams are, okay, here's how the planets are moving uh, in the sky and what this means. So it was still something that you could, that you could trace and you could say, okay, I know when, you know, where this planet is going to be at this time, but it was, it was just a different, I have trouble sort of wrapping my head around it um, because it must've been so complicated to, to figure that all out, but they did because they were really smart and scientific in their methods. They just yeah, they, they actually calculated tables that you could use and you had to have your astrolabe and then you had to have your table and go back and forth and do the computations between the two. So, yes, the stars and the sun were easy. The moon and the planets were really hard. Were really hard. And I think I've got I think I've got some. OK, so I'm going to we're going to look at calendars and then I've got I do have some tables. Um, so the calendars were just part of the reason that um, that that they looked at the stars um, and, to, and, and had to calculate days is because they had to calculate um, uh, um, uh, like Easter <laughs> and, and, and uh, other cel celebratory days. And so they put them in calendars. When I think about medieval, so these are medieval calendars um, and they're very, they actually function quite differently than modern calendars. So you have a calendar maybe on your wall or in your phone where you note when you have um, meetings. A calendar um, in the Middle Ages functioned more like uh, the map of the church year. So um, these, here are the days which they um, calculated not as days of the month, but sort of in relation to each other. And then these are saints days and other kinds of celebrations. So you would have Christmas always falls on the same day, but then Easter, um, as it does today, sort of moves around depending on um, a calculation that you had to do, which also has to do with the, with the moon and you know looking in the sky, which is an interesting thing that we're so, this is something that we still do um, today. So here's a table um, uh, from a uh, manuscript from Naples, um, sort of early 14th century. Um, let me see, this is 361. Um, so this is, this is interesting. So this is from early in the manuscript. So this is tables for calculating. I'll, I won't read all of them, but there are an enormous number of things that these tables were created to calculate. So calculating the day of the week um, for any day from 1204 to 1512. Um, the various um, letters, let's see, time variation according to latitude and longitude, 
uh, which is important. Uh, the conjunction of the sun and moon from January to September from 1327 to 1367. So like very specific um, sort of dates and times and then the hours of the day. And so this is the first part of the manuscript. Um, and then this is followed by commentaries on the gospel and epistle readings. And then it's followed up um, by information about calculating the zodiac. So again, this is another manuscript where you have these sort of things that we would, I think to, to our minds, it's a little strange to have them all together, but to the minds of the people at this time, these were things that you thought about, you think about them together, um, which is sort of interesting. Um, and this is fun. So this is another one from uh, one of these German um, 15th century manuscripts. And this is the Zodiac man. So this is again for health, looking at what signs of the Zodiac, you know, depending on what time of the year is, here's where you're going to pay attention to um, taking blood or whatever, um, given that. So it's a very, very much part of the whole, a holistic uh, way of thinking about um, the world and treating yourself. Um, and finally, this is just an interesting one. And, and, I, and I have, I, I, made a, I finally made a facsimile of this. So this is a, a physician's belt book that's at the Rosenbach Library. Um, and it is, um, it also has, it has an opening calendar and it has information about bloodletting and it has several pages of these um, um, so, uh, moon, sort of charting charting the moon as well. So I don't want to take too much time with that, but it's kind of fun. Um, and then finally, I, I did mention at the start, one of the things that I wanted to do with the exhibition was to look at how we think about um, medieval manuscripts today and use them uh, in different ways. And so one way is through things like movies and uh, television shows. And so um, there was a movie made about three years ago called Star Wars, the, um, the, the, the Last Jedi. And in this, manus in this movie, there were manuscripts. And so a friend of mine and I um, looked at the manuscripts and we, in the movie, and we compared them with manuscripts at Penn. And this is one example that actually got into the, into the exhibition. So this is a manuscript uh, from Penn and this is um, the, the um, moon, the, you know, the, the moon over the course of the month. And if you look at the, this little manuscript page that they drew as part of the movie, um, there's this one part where this is clearly somebody, remember this is made by artists, uh, for the movie. So somebody saw probably not this manuscript, but something like it, because this is a very common diagram that you see in astronomical manuscripts and sort of made it part of, of that, which is kind of fun and neat. Um, so that's all that I have, and I'm happy to answer questions. And also if there are more questions for um, Professor Larson. Thank you so much and thanks to everyone for um, joining us tonight. I know that um, we were slated to finish up right around now, but I do want to make sure that if anyone wants to share any additional questions um, that we can get to those um, and just stay a few minutes late. And I did notice that uh, Professor Larson was able to share a couple of links in the chat if you want to kind of tell us a little bit about those. Uh, someone asked about the treatise, which I assume they meant the Chaucer treatise. So uh, those are links on the Chaucer treatise to the astrolabe. So perfect. Thank you so much. And I was able to add into the chat um, all of the links, including the online exhibition link. So as I had mentioned earlier, while we weren't able to open the physical exhibit due to COVID, we have online access. Um, so if you go to freelibrary.org backslash exhibitions, you'll see our medieval life section, or you can follow the link directly in the chat. Um, and I'm just giving people a moment or two to add any additional <coughs> questions you might have. And I also just want to make sure um, that folks saw the links that I dropped 
from Professor Larson with the Facebook group and then also um, additional information about the work that she's doing. So thank you again to our uh, presenters tonight. This was a really engaging talk and we'll be able to post the link online and share it with folks who are signed up who weren't able to come tonight. Um, and please do go to um, freelibrary.org backslash exhibitions to see the online exhibition as well as freelibrary.org virtual programming where we have um, a number of really wonderful programs coming up through the end of January 2021 and we would love to have you so spread the word and thank you again to our presenters and I wish everyone a wonderful evening and a happy new year. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.